Good day and welcome back to the 40 Audi Podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. How are you doing today? Today, we've got a very special episode, as per usual. We're going to be talking all about autism and ADHD. Now, there's a bit of a funny story around this because I've um, had a few conversations with some um, ADHDers. ADHD, for anyone who doesn't know, is uh, basically the term for someone with who identifies as being autistic and ADHD. So I, I've been kind of going through my own sort of personal dive into what ADHD is all about. I think the f- the first time that I, I really sort of was able to kind of voice my my opinions and thoughts is when I was talking to um, Dr. Megan Neff, which if you haven't already watched that episode, it's a really, really great one, all about PTSD and CPTSD. But we were talking about that and that crossover was, it's been on my mind for a while. It's it's a little bit strange because I, I'm on I'm on a medication which is quite highly sedative, but it, I can't really remember a time when I when I wasn't on them, and I've always really sort of struggled with concentration, executive functioning. Um, some of those things that 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 I mentioned, they're kind of some things that are, you know, they, they cross cross over between diagnoses, so. We're going to talk all about that kind of crossover, what the differences are, what the similarities are, you know, whether whether you um, as an autistic person can know if, know if you might want to go for an ADHD diagnosis or, or explore it or vice versa if you have ADHD. So today I'm joined by Brooke Schnittman, uh, who is a, a master's and a master's, what does PCC mean? <laughs> <laughs> It's a professional coach certification and, and then the okay, board, okay. board so uh, certification a as well. And a, <laughs> a board certification, a certified uh, specialist. <laughs> We're going to leave it in. It's, it's funny. <laughs> it's me trying to wrap my head around speaking. I really stood, you know what? I think I might, you know, also have some kind of sort of dyslexia kind of experience of things because I found it really hard to like read off like yeah. the page. Yeah. Many, many ADHD years have that. Really? Well, yeah. we, we, we will get into that. Brooke <laughs> is a certified coach specializing in ADHD and founder of Coaching with Brooke. Uh, Brooke and a team of eight coaches help individuals um, with ADHD, eight to 80, gain the tools and accountability to lead empowered lives. Brooks also works with individuals with ADHD since 2006, as she graduated her master's in students with disabilities from New York University. She is also the host of the Successful with ADHD um, podcast, which shines a light on the strength of ADHDers. Maureen Brooke, how are you doing today? doing great Thomas it's so glad I'm glad that we are finally here connecting again <laughs> yes of course yeah and uh, we, we had a um a, a scheduled podcast yesterday but I've my brain's been all over the place at the moment which is probably very apt for our conversation today <laughs> so so we missed that and and Brooke was really great in in rescheduling and we're here today the day after um very thankful for that it's all good well, um, it. <laughs> would you like to tell us a little bit about your your sort of online work? Because uh, we know that you've you sort of you specialize in kind of coaching and you you own like a business and stuff. But what does your like online content tend to cover? Yeah, so um, you and I initially um, connected over Instagram. So I would say that our biggest following is there. But we do a lot of carousels that break down ADHD. Um, some of the nuances of it and tools to help people with that area of their ADHD. So if someone Mm -hmm. maybe doesn't recognize that that aspect might be in fact part of their ADHD, it shines a light on that. 
And if they've been struggling in that area, we give them tools for that. So it's a great resource. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's literally a library of like every single aspect of ADHD. We also do an Ask Brooke on the fourth Sunday of every month. And is that like an Instagram live? Like, uh... No, I put questions into my story and people can ask the questions mm-hmm. and then I personally respond within that day. But I do tons of Instagram lives. Successful with ADHD is a podcast. However, after the podcast, we go on live on Instagram with whomever mm-hmm. I spoke with and answer the questions from the public and kind of just go deeper into some of the topics that were discussed. So there's lots of free information there, but you can find me on all platforms under coaching with Brooke. Well, um, in terms, in terms of your, um, your, like your podcasts and stuff, when did you start that? And what kind of, I mean, I imagine that it's, it's related to the ADHD and autism and stuff like that, but it'd be interesting to know, like what your, your sort of journey with is with that did you do you do any yeah. like presentary stuff before that or is it it's kind of thrown yeah. into the deep end kind of thing so i uh used to be an administrator in a school system so i was working with individuals with ADHD since 2006 worked in a uh, as a special education teacher for 8 years and then an assistant director of special education so with that mm-hmm. i did a lot of presentations i was also in different leadership roles and then in my company, did some, you know, news stories, pod, other people's podcasts. And then mm-hmm. I was joined by um, a fellow member of Different Brains, which is a neurodiverse company. And uh, we are currently and previously doing a podcast called the ADHD Power Tool. So that was, has been going on for like, Two and a half years. I have two podcasts, I know. But we've taken (laughs) a little bit of a break because my co-host is studying for his MCATs. So I figured at this time it would be perfect to start my own podcast that initially started just as an Instagram Live. And I feel empowered to, to finally do it on my own. And I think that imposter syndrome, which is huge for people with ADHD and neurodiverse brains and even entrepreneur women, I didn't think that I was capable of doing a podcast. I've had my company for five years and I've been wanting to do a podcast, but I'm like, who wants to listen to me? So finally, I just got out there on Instagram, put my face out there. I'm like, you know what? If I can do it here, I can do it on the actual podcast platform. Mm -hmm. So we started it it launched three weeks ago, successful with ADHD with two oh, L's. Wow. And we're already in the top 10% of ADHD podcasts. So it's exciting. Nice. Nice. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, um, I find it, I find it really interesting, like in our pre-chat when we're talking about sort of the world of, of sentence, special, special educational needs and disabilities. I think that's, is that the acronym? Yeah. It's different by you and as it is here. So in the US, they call it something different. So like in in New York, they call it the Committee of Special Education. So that's CSC. In Florida, they call it ESE. Uh, hmm. It's interesting, like the, the different dialogues between between countries. <laughs> right, that both speak well, English, but just yeah, uh, you know, slightly different <laughs> words. Yeah, it's like the uh, horse horse riding in the UK is horseback riding US. Wow. Sidewalk in sidewalk in the US is path in English <laughs> in England. Fascinating. There's some, other, there's some other ones. Oh, pants. Flat. Yeah, that's 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 the. Uh, that's that's the old one, pants first underwear. <laughs> Wait, so for underwear, people in the UK say pants? Yeah, yeah. So what do you so say for, for pants? <laughs> like joggers, probably, like if they're like, sort of the cotton youth kind of fabrics. But yeah, well, that, if those are like, joggers. <laughs> or trousers. Trousers, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
That's good yeah. to know. So if so, someone's saying they're not wearing their pants, I know that <laughs> there's an issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I've had a, a few conversations with sort of American people, and I, that 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 has been something that that kind of makes people go like, you know. But um, yeah. I mean, just just thinking about like the the world of. I'm just going to say SEN because I can't remember the acronyms, but like it's it's interesting because you know to to me the, there is sort of distinct sort of fields within like the realm of like neurodiversity. You have like parents, you have adults, you have professionals, and there's obviously like subsets of each of them, and you have like partners of neurodiverse people and friends, but they're very separate. Like mm-hmm. the terminology sort of the the attitudes they tend tend to be quite quite different i know that in the uk they don't they don't tend to deviate quite as much but i have seen sort of in the us that those kind of spheres tend to be kind of more boxed off so I'm, i guess i'm really interested in like you know your experience working in those sort of high level positions sort of having that that sort of influence on you know, special needs education in, in the U.S. Yeah. So coming from a school background initially, um, I was grateful to work at two of the best schools. Um, one was the best school in the country and one is the best uh, spe- special education public school in the whole of US. on Long Island. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. And one was the best special education public school. Uh, or program, we should say, uh, on Long Island. So I was thankful for that. And I felt that um, students received the accommodations that they needed um, very often, which isn't Mm -hmm. always the case in certain public schools. I am in Florida right now, and I'm fighting hard to get the accommodations that my stepson needs Um, Both of my stepsons have ADHD. So I think it's really uh, the nuances. You need people who know what they're talking about and what they're doing. And knowledge is power. And don't settle. As well, the the experience angle as well. Because I I imagine that, no, I'm I'm right in thinking that that you're an ADHD as well. I am. I am. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Just checking. Yeah. Um, yeah. just case my, my brain is so foggy at the moment. So it's, that's um, okay. Yeah. And check, ironically, but, um, even though I've been working with ADHD for 17 years, I didn't realize I had ADHD until four years ago when I self-diagnosed <laughs> and then got a real diagnosis from wow. um, a psychologist in the area. So yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But I would say that, again, just like don't settle. If you are a parent or your student, make sure that you're getting the accommodations that you deserve. And also over accommodations aren't always good either. So you want to make sure that it's within your needs yeah. and not just speculating that one day you might need this. So you can always mm-hmm. revisit in any public school system, your individualized education plan. You can have as many meetings as you want. So I want to put that out there for all those parents who are worried. You can request a meeting from the school at any time. Awesome. Well, I'm, I mean, I, I suppose a really good good sort of place to start off with is, I mean, we're, we're going to be talking about sort of like the particularly around the crossovers. I think, you know, in the past I've done, I've done a couple of things sort of around ADHD, but I've never sort of explored like the world of ADHD. So mm-hmm. I guess like, no, what what are the similarities and like crossovers between like the two diagnoses? Like wh- whether it be something to do with the actual like diagnostic profile or whether it's to do with your own sort of professional experience. Yeah. So they are very similar. And sometimes people confuse the two. And sometimes people are diagnosed with one and not the other. And then they realize they have both. So I know we were speaking before now, and there's over 50% of individuals with autism 
who also have ADHD. Some studies wow. show 50 to 70% of individuals with autism have ADHD. So both ADHD and autism affect the central nervous system, which is responsible mm-hmm. for movement, language, memory, social and focusing skills. But the amazing thing about it is if you get the services that you need and you find out that you have autism at an earlier age, there are so many things that you can do to help your language, your memory, your movement, um, you know, social interactions. So it can, like, it doesn't go away, but it's just like ADHD doesn't go away. But there are so many ways to empower yourself and to, you know, get the yeah, get the help you need. I think it's it's um it's less about sort of getting over it, more like in terms of uh, making adjustments like within your own life, like how you correct. You know, no. So for me, for me t- particularly, I like to be pretty much. I don't tend to have a lot of social interaction. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean I don't tend to like it. It's something that I do quite enjoy, uh, just in very small bursts. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's there's that adjustment, and then there's things like sensory adjustments that that I make pretty much on a daily basis. Where 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 would those you know, if we were to kind of look at it in a sort of broad sense, where would those like two things sort of cross over, like? Because obviously there are so those similarities, but which kind of diagnostic criteria would you would you say that that kind of yeah. have that crossover? Yeah. So both individuals with ADHD and autism uh, can have intense fixations uh, with interests. So you know we can get very excited and hyper fixated on a hobby and an interest, and then it bores us, and then we move on. Mm-hmm. So there's one crossover. Uh, we both have emotional dysregulation. So uh, we have difficulty regulating our emotions due to the third thing, executive functioning issues. Mm. My enemy. <laughs> so there is where you see a lot of overlap. And then, of course, I'm happy to share the differences um, but that is part of the reason why sometimes it can be challenging. Mm to know, you know, if you have autism or ADHD or both. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to kind of, I I think it would be cool to kind of zoom in on on like the particulars of those things, because I think for me, when I've, when I've talked to people who are just ADHD or know that they're ADHD, but maybe, maybe might be autistic. I don't know. You never know. But, um, they, they, they tend to say that they're, sort of fixations and interests tend to be like a lot more um they tend to shift quite a lot and one one sort of comparison that i've found with autistic people is that we tend to have more more stable sort of longer term kind of interests on things yeah i did a post recently on a concept called autistic monotropism oh i saw that pop up today yeah, it's 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 kind of a sort of quite a simple sort of concept that has a very complicated sounding name, but it's uh, basically someone's predilection to be like, you know, when we're when we're focusing on something, when we're interested in something, we get more of that sort of we get more of those those blinders, that kind of tunnel vision mm-hmm. um, on our interests and. For a lot of people, um, particularly myself, um, in terms of hyperfixation on like getting really focused on something, it, I can often spend an entire day not <laughs> not eating, not not drinking, not feeling oh, like yeah. I need to go to the toilet because I'm so focused on like a project that I'm doing or a video that I'm doing. And quite often, I have the real big issue of finding a cutoff point particularly in the evenings i i do i have fall fell into the trap many many times in my life of allowing myself to go past a certain time that i've set for myself 
because what once I kind of go when I'm pro- prolonged working for like over my set designated time, it's like those rules that I had are kind of blown out the water, and I'll just I'll just continue working and working and working until I I'm you know I get migraines or I get tired or you know there's some like external force on me. Yeah, Thomas, can I ask you a question? Does yeah. that help you relax too by getting hyper fixated on an yeah. interest of yours? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I mean, it it can definitely be work. I mean, it's it's interesting because when whenever I've done sort of psychotherapy and stuff around anxiety um, and sleep and such, uh, they they always recommend that I try and reduce the amount of stimulation that I get sort of during the nighttime. And they're saying like, oh, listen to an audio book or read a book. Um, but for me, I need to do something. So I need to write or, you know, what, what I tend to do it during the evenings that works pretty, pretty much every time is I'll set my phone at the lowest brightness. I'll turn on the, the warm, the warm setting on it uh-huh. and I'll just like tilt the screen away from me and I'll play like a game. And then I'll just tend to kind of drift to sleep when my meds kick in, but I hear you. There's a battle between stimulation because sometimes we don't have enough stimulation and sometimes it's too much stimulation, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I I get kind of restless if I'm not doing something. Like I'm not sort of having a particular focus on something. I definitely have that. Sometimes it doesn't go so well and it didn't go so well last night. And um, I had a really sort of intense kind of uh, feeling of an you know we call it autistic inertia where um you know the longer that you kind of stay hi- hyper fixated on something you know the longer that that goes on the harder it is to kind of break out of that that thing you know it's where things like issues with like transitions and mm-hmm. things like that routine changes come in because you kind of build up that speed it's like you're you build it's like a steam train. It's like you set in the the steam train and you just as the more that you go on, the like faster that it gets. And then like if you want to break, eh, it doesn't really it's work really so, hard. Much, so much. You gotta <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Gotta Hallowell get it in the space. talks about the Ferrari brain, right? The and the mm-hmm. Chrysler brakes. It's really hard yeah. to stop. Yeah. And quite often if you if you're not in a good place and you kind of let it run rampant, you can lose a tire. <laughs> Definitely. Big blowout. <laughs> but like in, in terms of like hyperfixation, what what kind of differences have you seen sort of between autistic and ADHDs? So my specialty really is ADHD. And I would also say that and this doesn't go for everyone because it's a spectrum, right? So this mm-hmm. isn't a one size ADHD or one size autism, but I've seen more like anime and Legos and trains and what else? Like comic. There's, yeah. Yeah. Like, like Comic-Con, I, I forget. I guess it's anime, but more like fantasy Yes, for the autism. But Mm -hmm. again, you know, I have children with ADHD and they're not diagnosed with autism. And, you know, one of them loves anime and loves Legos. So I don't, I don't really know the, if there is like a huge difference, mm. but I do I know. Meant, I meant more as like the, the kind of like the presentation of the hyper focus, like oh. cause I know with ADHD, you have like the, um, the focus, the focusing tends to be a little bit more erratic and, you know, if it, and it, for, I, I would probably give the example of, for me, you know, if I'm, if I'm focused on something, and I hear a noise in the corner, or someone shouts my name, or I get you a text can. message. I just don't, don't hear I just it. don't. No. Yeah. So I, I just continue in that focus mode. But yes. Yeah, I think, think that's that different? 
I don't know is the answer, but I, I do know in like when someone in my experience, and again, this is not mm-hmm. everybody, and when someone sure. is hyper-focused um, or hyper-fixated on something with autism and you interrupt them and you like really yeah. try to get them out of that, it it's a tr- that transition can be intense. Yes. It could yeah. be really the difficult. Anxiety, right. The that anxiety, the frustration, yeah. all of that where they, they need that preparation. Now, individuals mm-hmm. with ADHD also can have difficulties with transitions as well. So, but yeah, I believe that individuals that I've seen with that transition in who have autism have a harder time transitioning for sure. Mm-hmm. And what about um, sort of the aspects of emotional regulation? Like, I know for for autistic people, there's quite a high sort of co-occurrence of this. Um, I don't know if you can. I, I think it's more of a trait. It's less of a like a diagnosed condition, but um, more of like the alexithymic kind of experience of struggling to focus yourself internally and understand mm-hmm. or or realize or identify uh, what emotion you're feeling, particularly yeah. in in the moment. Yeah. I think that in order to gain more of a sensory stimulation or like to stim due Mm -hmm. to what you're talking about, like individuals with ADHD might flap their hands, might rock, like those repetitive behaviors, the echolalia, repeat that same sound over and over again. And it's it's to help them stay focused mm-hmm. and yes, yeah, right. And at the same time, <laughs> they can have difficulty with like intense sensory d- sensitivity. Mm-hmm. So, someone I'm close to who does have autism, little things might really bother him you know, whether it be chewing, you know, yeah, noises from far that, away. Misophonia. Misophonia, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So might have an intense reaction to those types of sounds. In, t- in terms of like ADHD, would you find that, because I, I, I mean, just as a, as a sort of guess, because I, I haven't done a lot of sort of research or, or work around ADHD would would the emotional regulation or the most more dis- dysfunction kind of aspect of ADHD be more around things to do with like positive emotions or you know like the Im- uh, so yeah a lot of I, I don't know if this is answering your question but even neurotypical Oh, excited. Yes, we get impulsive, although not, mm-hmm. you know, everyone with ADHD has impulsivity. We have a lot of mental or physical activity. We're quick, like you said before, to jump to different hobbies and tasks and jobs where maybe someone with autism will hyper fixate on something for a little mm-hmm. bit longer than someone with ADHD. Yeah. And as far as negative thoughts go, we, you know, all individuals have negative Not thoughts sure. and then neurodiverse brains have a negativity bias on top of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'd imagine that a lot of the sort of the emotional dysregulation with ADHD would be like more, more akin to like not stopping and just continuing to like burn for you, you like your, your gas tank constantly. Yes. Where, yes. Whereas with autism, it's more like I mean, to be honest, I, I I experienced the same, that same kind of feeling of, you know, burning yourself out by doing too much. But I think a lot of the emotional overwhelm that I experience, it tends to be with the sensory, like almost always like 99% of the time, the sensory and the social stuff Yeah, is le- is less, less as much of me kind of just absolutely taxing my brain, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
The person I was describing before loves to tax their brain, (laughs) but also has ADHD and autism. Mm -hmm. But, you know, both ADHDers and individuals with autism thrive on routine, even though we hate it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Going back to those transitions. Yeah. You know, we like doing our own thing. We don't like following rules. We don't Mm -hmm. like other people telling us what to do. But at the same time, we like that pre- preparation. We like to know sure. what's coming. That sure. can emotionally calm our brains. Hey, up. Just popping on to say thank you for listening to this podcast this far. If you could do me a real solid, please make sure to rate the podcast if you're on a podcasting streaming service. And do all that like, subscribe, comment stuff on YouTube. Damn, even send a heart in the comments if you don't feel like typing. Make sure to check out my link tree, which is always down below in the description, or head over to my Instagram page at Thomas Henley UK for daily blogs, podcast updates, and weekly lives. This podcast is sponsored by my favorite noise cancelling, noise reducing earbuds that you can adjust the volume on. Really, really great thing. They're called D Buds, and you can find the affiliate link down in the description of this podcast for a 15% off discount. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. That's all from me. Hmm. Well, um, I know we talked a bit sort of like the sort of the similarities and the crossover, but what about like in terms of diagnostics, in terms of sort of the ADHD versus autism experience? What are the, what are the differences like? If you could, if you could pick some things out that would sort of deviate between the two, which which kind of things would those be? I'm not looking at the DSM five right now. If I was to pull it up, I w- I would probably have a better idea. But I would say, to your point, the big differences with autism and ADHD for autism, it's the sensory, the social difficulties. The, the speech delay or the unusual speech with mm, ADHD, processing. the processing, but both of them have processing. Like both AD, a lot of individuals with ADHD have slow processing or are also diagnosed with an auditory processing disorder or some other type of processing disorder. I was diagnosed with a processing disorder early in life. But individuals with ADHD have difficulties with concentration impulsivity very often, the hyperactivity, and the hobby jumping. But we Mm -hmm. both have the executive dysfunction, the executive, uh, the emotional dysregulation, the fixations. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's interesting. Like, I think one, one thing that I find particularly hard to wrap my head around is because, you know, quite often when we think of neurodiversities, because because there's such like a wide array of experiences for uh, each individual person, it can be sometimes hard to like box people into specific groups. Um, yes, <laughs> because I, I've I've heard as well that that there are or there tends to be some kind of I mean it tends to be different just from the ADHD people that I know, but there tend to be some some issues in terms of like socializing sometimes. What what kind of things do you think, you know, those those would be like uh, for think, ADHDers? I, for ADHDers, for socializing, we can very often overshare and then feel bad about it afterwards. Mm. Um, and that comes with that impulsivity and regulation. And, you know, sometimes we like to go hard and then we need to relax and I know that individuals with autism as well very often need that time as well to come down mm-hmm. from all the stimulation that they're seeking throughout the week and throughout the day. So if I find that when I'm, I'm thinking of one individual in my head, but I'm not going to name them, of course, but um, I know so it's someone that does have like ADHD diagnosis. I don't think they're autistic. They haven't explored it or anything, but I, I'm I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but 
but I find that for me, for me talking to them, it tends to be like this, this kind of strange dynamic where I'm very sort of direct and blunt and I can kind of, I tend, tend to be able to concentrate more on, on the topic. Whereas when I'm talking to someone with, you know, ADHD, it tends to be the case that we'll talk about, I'll talk about something, I'll give a monologue and then they'll start talking about it, but then they'll kind of veer off track yes. and just start talking about other things. <laughs> and then I, and then I ask a question Yes, and then I kind of bring them back to it or, or it can be like sort of on the more like short term thing where I start speaking, I'm very slow in my processing and Sometimes I'm quite mellow in the way that I deliver things. Yes. <laughs> so sometimes just, they're like, you, you just know, reminded like me. Concentration. Yes, as I'm doing to you right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> no, you it's just right. reminded me like my interactions with certain people with autism, very literal. My. Mm assistant has autism and it has helped me become such a better communicator where I got distracted in my communication with ADHD, like you're saying, but you can't when you're talking to someone with autism, they need to know black and white, <laughs> what it is that you need from them, right? Or mm -hmm. what it is that you mean, those little nuances in humor or in knowing someone who I'm close with, who likely has autism as well, you know, when you're feeling a certain way without expressing it, saying I mm -hmm. am sad or I am feeling this way, it might be hard for that person to pick up on how you're feeling. Yeah. That, that aspect of cognitive empathy, definitely. I don't think it's, I, am I right in thinking that that's not something that ADHD has experienced like the it's phrases of other things um cognitive empathy basically it's the ability to do exactly what what you just said it's the ability to to know how someone's feeling just based on indirect cues and not that sort of direct verbal kind of explanation more emotional expression over emotional explanation correct and um, I don't think that an individual with ADHD um, from the majority of people that I work with and mm. know have as hard of a time with that. Yeah. I believe that we're more hypersensitive. And because of that, we have that empathy to be hyper aware of how other people are feeling to a point mm -hmm. where we're compensating for someone else and their needs and we put that over our own so we're mm -hmm. like so alert and aware of everyone else's feelings mm -hmm. i think it's um you know there, there, there is sort of like a sort of a difference between like cognitive and adaptive and adaptive is that element of once you know how someone's feeling yeah you're, you're empathic you respond you respond correctly to, to how they're feeling. So you'll you'll comfort them, you'll do things for them, you'll talk to them. It's, it's that aspect of knowing, I think, that's the hardest. And it's it's been described as other things like theory of mind or like, you know, the the sort of the difficulty of putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And also like in terms of emotional expression as well, because we don't tend to have as much of the facial expression, the body language and the tonality changes when we, when we're in certain emotions. Right. So it's hard for us to really identify with someone when they're, they're kind of like openly expressing it, you know, cause perhaps when we're sad, we might just look completely blank and just talk in a very sort of mellow voice, you know, but we might be like, 95% anxious, like we're nearly, nearly going to have a blow up. Whereas for other people, you can see it, they'll be like fidgeting, they'll be like, you know, like showing those kind of visual signs. 
so that's probably that's probably a good good sort of key difference that sort of cognitive empathy part because yes and to that point too you know you can think that someone with autism might be mad at you Mm -hmm. by having that tonality of voice yeah but they're not or just just not not being serious Yeah, yeah right exactly Exactly. You, have, you have so many issues like especially within like the realm of psychology and stuff like when you get in counseling or you're working with like a mental health worker or you're getting psychotherapy or even to be honest in most places like in life we tend to approach people and say something that is completely conflicting with how we're acting like and that, that can be really hard for people to kind of grasp we call it like flat affect. Mm-hmm. Like we don't appear to be in distress, but we definitely are. I think it, it can make it really hard in those settings because perhaps people might not take us as seriously if we say, "I'm, I'm very depressed, and I'm, you know, not, not feeling good, and I'm thinking all about all these these horrible things." Uh, but if someone said, "Like," I'm feeling really depressed and I'm just, I'm thinking about such horrible things. And there's more of that like congruence between the two. Right. So people it's not take it what more you seriously. say, it's how you say it, right? Yeah. So a, a lot of the like training that people did to kind of understand autism in terms of emotions kind of focuses around, you know, if, if we're directly explaining our emotions, it literally means that it's not it's not less by the fact that we're not expressing it as much on the outside. So it's very interesting. Like it contributes to things like, um, what's the name of those? Faux regulation. Sort of faking that you're regulated when you're not. Yeah. So like inside you, your that mind's masking. going all places. Yeah. You're masking that intense panic, but on the outside you're like calm and you're talking to people like you usually would. But, yeah, they've done some studies around it. It's really interesting, like around like cortisol and sort of it being heightened more in us and then taking longer to fall back down. Hmm. So would you say that the anxiety associated with autism is higher than the anxiety associated with ADHD? I'm not Usually. sure. Okay. It tends, I mean, just from my experience, autistic people, we tend to retreat when we're anxious. I don't mm-hmm. know, sort of on the the ADHD side, because I imagine that there's a lot of, due to the fact it's that you have that hyperactivity element, that you are moving a lot, and you, you're sort of doing things, and you're sort of coping mm-hmm. with that anxiety and stress by getting the movement, whereas for us, we kind of just sit with it and just kind of ignore it and or mm. sometimes just not even recognize it that that we're, we're feeling that way so it, may, it might i think it, it might there might be some like differences in how we sort of process it possibly interesting yeah well um i guess like that sort of the natural follow-on to that is you know what is it like to be an audhd <laughs> What is it like to have a dual diagnosis of autism and ADHD? So I I don't have autism and ADHD, but I can speak from, you know, people I know who do and mm-hmm. clients I've worked with and just from what they've shared with me and what I've studied. So again, like I can't speak from someone who has it, but intense hyperfixations, like you said, uh, with the autism piece. But then, you know, pulled aside by the stresses of other people's needs. Um, So like high anxiety about are they meeting, you know, their loved one's desires and needs. Yes. The, The sensory piece for sure. So the overstimulation, getting angry about Mm -hmm. some of those things and, and speaking out about it or running away from it 
needing a lot of time where it almost looks like it's antisocial, but yeah. a lot of time to just come down from the overstimulation. Mm-hmm. Very successful. So Albert Einstein, right, is yeah. suspected to have had ADHD and autism as well. Oh. Big visionary. Yes. Right? So we know that um, Elon Musk has autism. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he has ADHD. So big visionaries. We get visionaries with people with ADHD and visionaries with people with autism. I believe that from what I've seen, individuals with autism and ADHD do like to try to fit in as well. So mm. with that neurodiversity, there's the masking, but then when you're working with someone, there's the awareness and then trying to figure out your place in life. Yeah. And trouble with eye contact sometimes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, either like being funny, but also having yeah. a hard time understanding Under- other people's humor. <laughs> yeah. What's it saying? Saying things that are inappropriate <laughs> for the social context. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And also having a hard time again with executive function, the planning, the organization, emotions, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's hugely intertwined. So it's, I, th- I think a lot, a, a lot of things that I've I've heard from from people is like the, the main the main thing that I see from ADHD as sort of doing their posts and stuff is that they kind of have this weird sort of push pull um, dynamic with how they they go about life. So it's like they really, really like intensely need that sort of fixed daily routine that they know what they're doing at every every hour of the day um it's sort of a regular thing every week but then they also have that like sort of the the more adhd kind of side where it's like the the it's like they kind of screw themselves over because they want they kind of they know that they need to have that routine to focus them and kind of provide them that that sort of comfort but that they don't want to plan it and they don't want to be set into this box, right? They don't want yeah. to follow rules and structure, even though it's good mm-hmm. for them. But it's, yeah, I mean, and also as far as routines go, same restaurants, same movies, same, mm-hmm. um, yeah, day to day, same people. I find also that individuals with ADHD and autism, when they socialize, like being around people who are interesting to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone enjoys conversation that can flow, but like they want communication with people who like are more intellectual or like who like get them, you know, who they can Mm -hmm. talk history with, who can talk facts with, you know, those types Mm -hmm. of conversations rather than just that small talk of uh, like nothing they want. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is what's going on. Let's like, let's deep dive into this. Right. Rather than just shooting the breeze. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think with like just autism on its own, I think we, we do tend to like that sort of more focused thing, but I suppose, I suppose then again, there's, there's like, if you're, if you're ADHD and autism, it's, you, you want to have that like deep dive on something, but then you keep getting sidetracked with the conversation yes. and sort of taking, taking different yes. side streets and stuff. Side and quests. I find, yes. <laughs> and I find that like someone else could be the, like in phone calls, for instance, like someone can call and then the ADHD, the odd HD, the autism and ADHD individual will sometimes hijack the conversation, right? And as if it was their conversation, although the other person was the one doing the calling. So then they have to kind of back up and be like, wait, 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 (laughs) sorry. 
you called, what was it that you wanted to talk about, you know? And listen, we so, do that with so just more, ADHD as well, right? So there's there's more of that kind of... Because for, for me, it takes me a while to sort of warm up to a social interaction. Like, I can't just jump straight. Like, it's like when, when, I, when I go about sort of my time at the gym, it's like I'm focused on my workout. I'm focused on um, my music. If someone comes up to me, I'm not expecting to talk to anyone. If if I do go to the gym with the expectation that I might talk to someone, it's it's not too bad because I can kind of sort of mentally prepare myself. But it's like that thing with the monotropism. It's like if if I don't expect to have a conversation with somebody and someone starts a conversation with me, it's it's almost like I don't know what to do with myself. Like it's it's kind of you know it's hard to get into social mood when. I'm sort of in that sort of productivity work mode. But I'd imagine if if you had that sort of more ADHD kind of influence that you might just be sort of more, more impulsive and sort of go into it a bit sort of quicker and yes. deeper. And... Yes, but it's it's usually more based on what's in that person's brain mm. that comes out first at least and then they catch themselves and they're like oh wait, wait, wait you know but again yeah. well, how's how's your day <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah yeah but again here's my story is, for 20 minutes here's my story. how's your day <laughs> exactly exactly but you know everyone is different there's a spectrum so i don't want to say it's always this way or it's never this way this is just my personal interaction with AUDHD with just ADHD, with just autism from the people that I've worked with, from the people I'm close with, this is what I've seen. Sure, sure. I suppose it's, it's, um, I suppose it's quite difficult, isn't it? I, the, the, I, I, think, I think the ideal would probably be, it would be interesting to have myself, you, and someone, someone who's ADHD, and sort of like, <laughs> have other questions about like, you could do like, uh, like a real way you ask like different questions oh, yes. to, to people, and like, you know, see if there's any like difference in how they well, feel you about and I, it. Or... You and I need to do that once this person is ready to come out with their diagnosis. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I would love really that. Cool. I would love that. Well, um, I mean, just in in terms, of kind of wrapping things up and thinking about sort of the more like practical applications about what we've talked about. You know, if you were to think of an autistic person, you know, we obviously talked about a lot of different sort of aspects that could could be applicable. But what, if you were autistic, what would you look for in terms of like ADHD traits? Like, you know, you might feel a lot of, you know, because of that crossover, you might be like a bit tentative about of exploring the the world of ADHD because that you know as you said the lines are very very blurry between the two Mm -hmm. what would you if if you were an autistic individual what would you what would you look for in in terms of like hey that you know this isn't sort of typically autistic experience maybe I should should go and sort of explore it a bit more yeah I would say that controlling impulsive behaviors, racing thoughts, daydreaming, Mm. being overly active, jumping from task to task. Yeah. You know, starting, getting sidetracked, like Mm -hmm. doing one thing, but then getting sidetracked by other things. Yeah. Because the other a lot of the other things overlap. Yes, yeah. I think that's really good because it's not, you know, I suppose the jumping from task to task, it's it's less so like an autism thing because of that like intense focus and the, the inertia and having to sort of break that and switch to another thing. Like sometimes it can take me any, anyway, depending on my mental health and sort of how much you know, I've done, you know, what my energy levels are like, I can, 
you know, sometimes it might take me about 15 minutes to kind of rearrange my head. It's like if if I if I go from perhaps work and I'm just like bang on as soon as I finish work, I get my clothes, I get the get my bag, go to the gym. I couldn't do that. It would just absolutely like send waves of anxiety through my body. I just wouldn't know where my head's at. And when I got to the gym, I'd be like, how did I get here? And, you know, this doesn't feel right. And it's almost like I have to kind of prep myself in order to make the jump from doing something like work-wise into rest and then preparing myself to go into something else. And there's those transitions, right? They're really hard. Mm -hmm. So doing those and transitions are hard for ADHD years too, but like, it could be really hard for someone with autism. So Mm -hmm. that prep work, like you said, whether it be an alarm or telling yourself, okay, you know, by this time I'm going to do X, Y, Z, and I'm going to have this ready. And then, you know, I'm going to need to go here. Lots of prep work, like you said. I think another thing that, you know, I I think that was a really great list of sort of things that you can look out for because, I think because of our tendency to be a lot more self focused and want to to want we kind of crave that feeling of just being fix fixated on something because it kind of it blurs out the sensory world it blurs out everything that's going on so we don't we don't tend to have for for well I don't tend to have from a lot of my experiences that sort of daydreaming aspect I work just kind of just get lost in thought a lot. I will have processing blips where I just forget everything that we're talking about and, you know, sort of, it's like my brain cuts off, but I don't like go off into thought and sort of follow that kind of train of thought around and sort of take different directions. I saw some, some really funny, funny memes. You have like, uh, someone did this, um, I don't know if it's a meme, but they did a reel where they were talking, they were explaining how it feels to be ADHD. I don't know if I'll be able to do this, but I'll give it a go. So like someone will ask them, oh, how's your day been? And they'll go, well, how's my day? Well, I did this and, you know, at work. And But then th- I saw I saw that lady, Karen, who was, you know, I'd, you know, you know what she's like. And the issue, you know, to be honest, yes. I, yeah, anyone who kind of acts like that towards me, it's it, it's kind of a big of a red flag. It's kind of like my ex. And my ex was, you know, he had all sorts of these kind of issues. Right. You really go like, to- like baseball for some reason. <laughs> you go to all these different tangents and you can go on and on and on. <laughs> I remember one of my friends growing up and it's almost like she got it out of me. She would go like this when I was talking and I was undiagnosed ADHD. <laughs> She's just like, like get to the point. I remember yeah. when I was even in ADHD coaching training, one person I was like sample coaching with, she was in my class. She was like, okay, you got there. You got there yeah. finally. Yeah. But it, it, we're verbal processors. So sometimes we don't even know like hmm. what it is until we get there. So it's that like more thinking out loud. Correct. Because for me, it's it's internal. It's like, I'll go quiet for like five, 10 seconds. I'll think about it and then I'll speak. Like um, Yes. Yes. So my assistant who has autism as well, uh, she's like that as well. So she'll be very quiet. I can tell when, um, you know, she's thinking about something, how she wants to say it to me. Um, if she's upset about something or like she has too much stimulation going on, I can see that, you know, things will kind of like break down a little bit and she'll need time to recover. Yeah. Yeah. So there's those little nuances. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. I suppose suppose looking, looking from the other side, I mean, I know, I know that that for you personally, you're not autistic. I suppose if you're if you're an ADHD, you know what what could you possibly look for about you know possibly pursuing an autism diagnosis? I mean, from 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 my experience, it tends to be like the the opposite way around. But I imagine that it could it could definitely happen. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I think, 
if I was to pitch in a couple of things, I think definitely the Alexa Fly Me aspect of things. Not being able to identify, I'd, um, notice or sort of tie emotions to events. Um, that tends to be something that that autistic people experience a lot. And also the the aspects of cognitive empathy, like like I said about sort of monitoring indirect communication. I'd say that those two, for me, those are like the biggest things when it comes to social, emotional stuff with like autism. Yeah. What, what do you think? Do you think there's anything that you would add? Yeah, I think for the hyper ADHD, hyperactive, impulsive type, it's easier to spot the ADHD very often. And, you know, if they've masked or adapted in certain ways or they're lower on the spectrum maybe of AD, of autism, they might just, the ADHD might be more prominent in them and that's mm -hmm. what they might be diagnosed with first. And also there's so much information on ADHD out there. I know we spoke about that at this point and I think the stigma has been broken a lot more and it hasn't been enough yet with autism. So I think that yeah. people might identify more if they have both with ADHD and then sure. maybe, I don't know, this is. That's eerie. really interesting. It's like that, that kind of stigmatizing. Cause I think, I think there's a lot of, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people, it, it feels, I mean, to, to me, if, you know, me thinking about me possibly having some AD, ADD, ADHD, um, it feels less sort of intrusive on my identity and it's more kind of you know i think of people who are adhd as they're like fun they're like positive to be around and it's like but when you think of like autism in terms of like the stigma and myths it's like oh you're yeah. socially inept you're a bit weird you have flat right. affect you're not very cool right you and you can challenge that too right because everyone yeah. it's a spectrum sure and also yeah. like with that intrusive piece that you're talking about, like, you know, before it was Asperger's and autism, right? They, yeah. they still were under an umbrella, right? But they were separated. Now yeah. it's autism spectrum disorder. So I'm curious from someone who has autism, you know, what that, that does for someone who's yeah. identified, I think it's 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 an interesting question. I know it's it's a very there are some trigger points within the autistic community, and a lot of the trigger points tend to be around what we call functioning labels, mm, like high functioning autism yeah. or whatever. Yeah, and and basically the the Asperger's label was was created by Hans Asperger who. So sort of a researcher in Vienna, they owned this really, really great children's hospital at the time, and it was taken over by sort of the Nazis during the Second World War. And yeah, and, and basically he made the distinction between two groups of people, um, one which he called Asperger's syndrome, which were people he deemed to be sort of useful to society. You tend to be... Obviously, the, there's social awkwardness sort of on the outside to them, but more of the the hyperfixation, the the sort of the more intelligent ones, mm -hmm. and sort of he boxed those people off so that they weren't removed. I won't go into too much about that, but so th th there's a bit of history around that, and you know we we have a lot of issues in the autistic community like fears around eugenics which has has been you know it's only in the last sort of 10 odd years where it's kind of been challenged in some sort of org some organizations so there's that there's that kind of split and i think a lot of people will respond will respond quite drastically to things like that because they you know they were very sort of quick to kind of identify that and sort of separate ourselves from the label for me, it's 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 quite a bit more complicated because I see the utility of having sort of set categories of people based on how, which needs they have. 
I think for a lot of people, it's just the terminology. It's like it's not nice to be called. What makes you someone high functioning or low functioning? Exactly. It's not yeah, like it's... you have high functioning ADHD and low functioning <laughs> ADHD. <laughs> Well, it's, it's like, it's it's not nice for someone to call you low functioning because, you know, what are you trying to say? Right. And it's not nice for someone to call you high functioning because you may have loads of issues, but be considered high functioning and people don't take you seriously. You don't get as many supports. You don't get as many adjustments. So, you know, they're, both of those terms, they're kind of, they, they box people off based on, on, you know, what their needs and their functioning levels, which is not something that people like to draw a lot of attention to. Sure. And, it, you know, sure. for me personally, it's it's something that I've, you know, thought about quite a lot. There's different ways of saying it nowadays. I think it's more about categorizations, but whenever we try to, whenever I try to kind of think about or have a dialogue around sort of the utility of those kind of categorizations. Um, it's almost it's almost always like a really hot point of, you know, people saying like, how how dare you? You're you're an ableist, you're saying that we're better than them and stuff like that. But then you have the parents of autistic people or or friends or supporters of autistic people who have like uh, intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, they they can't manage a job they can't live by themselves you know they have all right. these supports in place they can't communicate sometimes so there's that kind of there's that there's that tension around making that distinction which can often kind of shut down a lot of conversations around those things which then i'm so wondering it's... like now that people don't use the term asperger's right so now mm -hmm. it's asd one two and three which is basically, right. I think it's worse for the cause because, <laughs> because you, you're literally saying like, what level of autism do you have in one, twos and threes, which right. I don't think that's a good way of doing it, but. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a very complicated But you know what, with ADHD, word. there's mild, right. moderate and severe. So mm -hmm. I guess that's your one, two and three, but it's not indicative of intellectual ability. Yes. It's yeah. just the amount, like how prominent mm. the ADHD is. So I, th I think for me, I tend to make the distinctions because I tend to make the distinction based on if, if or not they have an intellectual disability. So I just say they're autistic and they have intellectual disability, which kind of, you know, it's not, we're not talking about levels of autism, but we're talking about autism and a different diagnosis. Mm -hmm. so it's 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 kind of hard working that line i think you know one one thing that i'd be really interested in knowing is around the sort of the particulars around identity and language before we before we sort of wrap mm. up because yes i find it find it really interesting because i mean for you you you've been sort of using that person individuals first language. with yep and in yeah, the UK, individuals it's with and if you say that in the US, it's offensive. Yeah, well, it's, you know, for, I think, I think for, in terms of autism, the consensus is for autistic adults is that a lot of us like, well, I just said it, we, a lot of us like to be identity first. Like, um, and th that it's, it's, it's weird because people who prefer one use of a language versus another, like they both have sort of positive intentions with it. Like the person first language, it's like, oh, person first. Like, of course we want to put the person first. That's great. They're different from this. They're they're better than this. And um, whereas when you have the <laughs> when you have the identity first, it's like, well, you don't want to box someone off into a category. But I, I think that the the real sort of difference is the the attitude in terms of identity, because if you view autism in sort of a neutral to positive way and you see, you see it as part of your your being and you don't feel like if you went autist if you feel like you you wouldn't be aut your same person if you didn't if you didn't have an autism diagnosis and it is something that i i feel for myself 
But then I, I, I do understand sort of, it, it tends to be sort of with the more person first language, it's something that's been used quite a lot in the world of education and parenting. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of been adopted for, for a different reason, but it's, it's all in the, the positive intentions of Absolutely. using that. So it's, it's interesting that like crossover between, but what about ADHD? Because I know individuals that there, there with some... ADHD. Yeah. It's the same, yeah. it's the same difference with the UK and the U S with the autism and ADHD. So I had this conversation with another podcaster in the UK and, um, coming from a school background, we had to be mm. very careful how sure. we identified someone with a disability. So even on an individual education plan, which is a legal binding document with services and accommodations, it's an individual with autism, that, an individual yeah. with ADHD, mm -hmm. an individual with um, depression, an individual with anxiety, it's not an anxiety person or an ADHD person or an autism <laughs> well, I think person. It's, it's right? interesting those crossovers. Like I've talked right. to people with like physical disabilities and you know, they don't want to be called physically disabled person. They, they want to be called a person with a physical disability. Disability. Right. But But in in terms of like the ADHD community sort of outside of education, outside of those kind of systems, do you think that ADHD is sort of prefer that person person first language or that kind of identity first language i think it depends where they're from <laughs> that's fair enough <laughs> so if I, they're I from the uk they're used to doing the identity first if from the us they are used to doing yeah. the but yeah i mean and some people are more sensitive to the labels than others mm -hmm. you know just like I think ADHD I'll, and autism, it's a spectrum, right? So everyone yeah. responds differently to labels, I think. Yeah. I think it's 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 generally consensus that identity first is preferred by a lot of autistic and, people. But yes, I and some the, people don't understand labels too. Some people without the diagnosis, or even with the diagnosis, you know, they'll say, Why do you need to label it? Yeah. You know, nothing happens in vacuum, which is true, right? So everything is nature and nurture. However, you know, it helps individuals usually to be more self-aware and be able to, you know, come from a place of strengths within their diagnosis as well, right? Like everyone has strengths, just, you know, human strengths that they mm -hmm. have based on their core strengths and their their core values, but then there's also typical strengths of individuals with autism and individuals with ADHD. So knowing those and knowing your boundaries with weaknesses can help you thrive with a diagnosis too. Well, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, it's, for me, it's, you know, I like to be referred to as an, an autistic person, but I'm also like, it, but only in the case of like, you know, if someone was to put a media piece out, I would prefer that they say Thomas is an autistic person rather than Thomas has autism, Thomas with, with autism, just as a personal preference. But I, I know that a lot of people can be very, uh, they can find that kind of difference in language very, very difficult to navigate. Um, mm. for themselves they can get quite upset if people use the wrong sort of terms for it so but to yeah, be honest that's, the majority that's interesting majority... so as someone sorry <laughs> it's okay <laughs> you go i think the, the majority of people they don't they don't mind either way they saw it. most most people use that i know use it interchangeably it's just kind of what fits with the sentence that you're saying but I know that it is kind of a, it has been a talking point in the past. Um, definitely. So, yeah, I'm curious, right? So you have autism, I have ADHD. So you're from the UK, I'm from the US. So when I identify you in a conversation, right, I would I say you're an autistic I'm individual autistic. because, right, you're autistic. And then when you talk to me, are you going to say- have ADHD. 
I have that's, ADHD. That's why I was kind of like, do I call you an ADHD? Do I say we've all right, right. So, yeah. <laughs> PC. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if it is a. I don't know if it is a sort of a regional thing. But meanwhile, meanwhile, I I call myself an ADHD all the time. It's just easier for me rather than. Mm-hmm dragging it out an individual with ADHD and in my social media and in my mm, newsletters, I very often, yeah, I very often use ADHD or and I've had some people even from the U S or the UK who've been offended by the word ADHD or so you just don't know. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I, th- I think the consensus is that I know, I know a lot of people like the identity first for for autism, but I think it's always just good to, to go by what the individual wants to use. Like, exactly. Like if <laughs> I want to change my prescribed. name. Exactly. Yeah. If I want to change my mm. name from Brooke to Beth, you're going to call me yeah. Beth, not Brooke. <laughs> if you want to be called, you know, a, a, an autistic person, then I'm going to call you an autistic person or autistic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what i love yeah 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 no and i i'm curious because i i've watched like all the seasons love on the spectrum i love love on the spectrum because it really highlights all of the ranges Mm. of individuals with sorry autistic people (laughs) and (laughs) <laughs> I would love to know your thoughts on that show. I love it. Love on the spectrum. Funny thing about me is I tend to avoid everything in the mainstream media that is at mm. all related to autism in fiction. Gotcha. Mostly because it hits a bit too close to home sometimes. I'm kind of used to watching things that have neurotypicals in that I feel very detached from. Like... I, I'm, I I like that sort of emotional distance, sort of like the difference between. I don't know. It's it's kind of, it's it's more more for me. It feels more like watching like a nature documentary, for me when I when I watch dramas and stuff that are, you know, have neurotypicals in. But when there's like autism involved, it's like. There's some aspects to it, and I know that Love on the Spectrum it's it's sort of a reality sort of tv thing i did watch the first season and i was actually quite surprised about sort of you know as you said the range of individuals that were on there they had they didn't from what i saw they weren't particularly going out for targeting individuals that have this set of stereotypes that they're looking for in order to generate clicks and to generate interest they did just have like a range of different people which i thought was really great Sometimes the the production choices, they're a little bit on the edge for me, particularly around music. <laughs> sort of the do 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 kind of the light, lighthearted, like they don't know where they are, they, they don't know what to do, and oh my God, what's going to happen? That kind of music kind of feels a bit circusy in terms of the music choice, which I wasn't too keen on. Mm-hmm. I wasn't. I was also not too keen on including a lot of the dialogue between the autistic individuals and their parents, mm. and sort of the ways that their parents handled kind of conversations. Yeah, yeah like they kind do of this. Make sure you prepare this way. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's fine. I think it's just more. I think they they kind of had this air of banter. Uh, the cameramen or the interviewers and the parents mm. where like the parents were like oh this is like rolling their eyes this is the autism thing like mm. um whereas you know the autistic person was just trying to have a conversation and just being themselves and stuff so it's kind of pointing that out as like a i don't know it may, it kind of felt felt a bit infantilizing in some aspects when they when they involve the parents um not to say that living with your parents or having them around or having input is bad. It's just kind of the way that they treated them when they were in front of the camera. It's like, oh, don't say that. Like, they're their own person. Let them say what they want. Right. Be authentically autistic, right? Like, that's what the show is all about. 
finding yeah, not, someone who understands helping, them. It's not about helping someone's kid get a, a date. Right. It's about helping an adult get a date. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> it's, it's, that, it's that kind of lens that they choose to frame it with, which is kind of rubbed me up the wrong way. But, you know, I, I thought it was generally quite quite good compared to perhaps some of the other stuff. There's another show, isn't there? There's like uh, The Undateables or something like that, which I think hmm. features a lot of autistic people. Sometimes. That's the maybe. title, Undateables. Yeah. Yeah. I think Love on the Spectrum was definitely a bit of a better design choice than The Undateables. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, it's it's been really, really great to talk to you about this kind of stuff. And I, I always find... Particularly when when things when categories or identities of of people have like a, a crossover between one another, and it's kind of hard to sort of pick pick them apart in terms of understanding like who you are. If you if you're an autistic person listening to this, you're thinking, "Hey, I don't know if I got ADHD or is that an autism thing?" Or you know, I I very much relate to that, and I'm I'm sure that if you you know you're an ADHD, you have ADHD. You know, you'll find that there's hopefully some of the things will be able to kind of make that distinguish and, and sort of possibly push towards sort of exploring autism a bit more. Yeah. I think what you said about the stigma um, around autism is a really big barrier. So it's really worth pointing that out. A lot of people don't identify with it, with it because of the stereotypes. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It's been really great. Thank you. Thank you for, um, love this. Coming to speak love to me. it. Thank you for have having you enjoyed, me. Have you enjoyed your um, 40 Auti experience, Brooke? Oh, it's been amazing. <laughs> good. <laughs> I got that. It took me it took me a second, but I got I got that. That was a good, that was a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, so we have come to the part of the episode where we do the very lovely segment called Song of the Day, where I ask my guests to provide a song which accurately sort of describes or, or touches something on the topic of the podcast or something that they personally enjoy and find useful. Usually we will I will put the description put the link. I'll put the description down in the link <laughs> to the Spotify playlist where you can find all of the different songs that people have contributed over the course of season two of the 40 OT podcast. Um, so Brooke, which, what is your choice, choice of song and why? So my choice of song is show me love by Robin. Okay. It's an older song. Robin I would S. say it's a, uh, huh. Uh, huh. And the reason is because it's been stuck in my brain and it's suggested on YouTube music, but also mm -hmm. I think it really highlights what we're trying to say here. It's like, the label is the label and we have to show ourselves love and compassion and other people need to, you know, see the real us. So show me love. Like it starts with us and knowledge mm. and awareness. I like this very it's upbeat also, as well. And fast. It's very and upbeat. I love it. Dancing. Yes. Do, I jam out a car. I know this song. I didn't. I didn't know it when I first. I'm playing it now, so I'm, I didn't know it when I was first playing it. But I definitely recognize it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. An oldie but a goodie. Let's a, yeah, let's add that to the playlist. You can find that down in the description. But before we leave, Brooke, would you like to share some links, some places that you would want people to go to? Absolutely. Coachingwithbrooke.com. You can find me on Instagram for a lot of free resources as well. Coaching with Brooke. Do, I mean, everything we do is ADHD. We have put in some autism and ADHD posts as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And then if you're, if you have ADHD and you have autism or you know someone who has ADHD, we launched my podcast a couple of weeks ago, Successful with ADHD. And that can be found on all major podcast platforms and it's a su successful with two L's. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for that. Now I'll put that down in the description as always. And, um, 
yeah, if you if you have enjoyed listening to us talk everything about ADHD and autism and the crossovers and the differences and all of that lovely stuff, please make sure to give me a rating, preferably of the five star variety over on Spotify, Apple, all of those places. And if you are on YouTube watching us, uh, watching me with my very smooth face after having a beard <laughs> for quite a while, uh, still look weird. But um, yeah. Make sure to give me a subscribe, like, maybe comment down below. Give me a blue heart. Really, really helps in terms of the algorithm and getting this this type of information, this message out to more people. And if you want to keep up to date with my life and check out my daily blog blog posts and reels, head over to Instagram at Thomas Henley UK. I am at the moment sort of going for a bit of a weird stage in my business because I've had this really crazy opportunity that's come upon me. And I've had to kind of take a little bit of a back burner on developing my business. But I am sort of leaning more towards the side of consultancy, um, personal consultancy rather than coaching. So basically all that would mean is that there's less of sort of a process and it's less about the outcome and sort of setting goals and achieving them. And more about sort of having a chat and understanding more about about autism, understand more about yourself, neurotypicals, relationships. And basically it, it kind of gives me agency to be a bit more recommendy with things, which kind of suits me a lot more and less of the paperwork and all of that kind of stuff. So that's that's probably what I'm gonna go with in the future. So pers- personal consultancy, you know. Yeah. So um You're gonna do an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. It'd be good to kind of get started and sort of, as you, as you said, sort of make my own way. And I've, I've had issues sort of with my imposter syndrome. It's like, am, am I going to be able to do it? Is the financial paperwork stuff too much? But taking it slow. And of course, if you want to check out that consultancy work or you want to get in touch uh, about the podcast, send in your thoughts. Um, I will try and read out some emails next time. So send them over. You can follow the link in the description to a link tree. You'll be able to find my website on there. There'll be a contact form that you can use to get in touch. But so (laughs) thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke. Thank you for being understanding about all the rescheduling and stuff. Oh, Um, stop it. It was one time. (laughs) I'm glad you didn't so, say the sorry. The neurodiverse and saying, podcast Thank experience. You. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, there, there would be a lot language. of rescheduling. <laughs> so, sorry is is a big family mm-hmm. word within within my family. We're we're sorry people. Like, any situation, sorry, say sorry. sorry. Nope. Yeah, sorry, we're, sorry. We're cutting out sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank well, you for thank having you me much. on today. Thank you very much to you the listener, the viewer, for tuning in to another episode of the 40 Audio Podcast. And I will see you in the next episode in a week. See you later.